My name is Lemuel Life LaRoche and I'm the executive director of Chess and Community and I want to welcome you to our 8th annual Chess and Community Conference. While COVID-19 has shifted how we engage in our physical activity, we now got an opportunity to let you see what we do virtually. And now we allow the whole world to see the great work that we're doing in Athens, Georgia. Follow us, enjoy what you see today, and we're challenging you to be a part of the solution in your community. Follow us. Each year, Athens Clark County Police face off with Athens Youth in a friendly chess match called Justice Serve. This engagement aims to encourage positive police and community relations in our community. We hope that by playing chess, we can learn to meet the person in front of us and overcome the stereotypical identities we have created about each other. Watch what happens when our peers engage with police officers in a friendly chess game. Speaking from experience here or whatever, like it's like the cops here don't really care. But also it can seem like they're being, like they're harassing at times too. So I feel like majority of the time, it feels more like they're harassing you or whatever, rather than them actually trying to help you or be helpful. I don't think that all cops are bad. Um, it is just, you know, like a little harder to know which ones are good and bad, but the ones that I've met so far are caring and nice. Uh, it's honestly kind of just a weird relationship because I would never expect that relationship with an adult, let alone a cop. It's kind of scary, I guess, to be around some cops because I feel like I'm guilty even when I know that I'm not. But as far as just my personal experience and what I've seen, I don't have the best relationship with cops because of the way that they present themselves in the community uh, and just the overall laws that we have with them. But one thing I am worried about is the direction of my community because I feel like a lot of people took what happened, especially over the summer, out of proportion. I know some people were like, abolish the police, and I was like, hold on now, like, as much as we want to do that, we do rely on them for some things, so we have to think of a collective solution to create change. Um, instead of just protesting or posting, we need to actually come together and work this out and take action. Um, I personally don't have a lot of trust for police. It kind of scares me, seeing as ever since I was in elementary school, I always heard about police brutality even if it didn't end in death. And some of the events that have taken place haven't just been police fault because there are laws in place that make these, make certain uh, police actions, they make, they allow it. And um, so it kind of, it worries me that certain laws haven't been changed and more hasn't been done internally from national police forces. But uh, I still hold on to a slim bit of hope just want to make a better tomorrow for my kids. This interaction, um, to me, is just going to help build relationship, and that's what um, many of us, most of us, actually just want to do. We just want to build relationship. Um, over the past years, we really just haven't built and come together, and that's pretty much what we need to do, is just come together more so we can have um, better communities, better worlds. Um, honestly, I've never really had a bad interaction with one, just because I've always been in a place where, like, I've gone to predominantly white schools, I've been surrounded by a lot of white people, so I've never just had that type of interaction. But at the same time, I know that I can't be doing some of the same stuff as them because I, I won't, like, end up in the same place as them. I mean, when, I know for me, when it comes down to competition, it's me against you, but as soon as we shake hands, I just want to get to know you. This is an opportunity to bring our Clark County Police Department face to face with our youth. And as you got a chance to see, you know, what the kids' visuals, what their concerns, what are their experience with police officers, and you got a chance to see also good police officers that are doing great things. We're here for a kind of abbreviated version of chess and community uh, due to COVID restrictions and things like that so we have to try to limit exposure as much as we can. We're bonded with young people, bonded with members of the community because again we have to use uh, a collective effort with the community and us to build trust. So I think chess community is an excellent way of doing that. Uh, it's an excellent way of 
kids getting to see the other side of police officers other than just the uniform. I think it'll, it'll give them a chance to see that, you know, uh, we care about our, our youth, that uh, they can see that uh, us as police officers are the same like them, that, you know, uh, just because we have this uniform on us doesn't make us the bad guy. We don't look at them in the light of being a bad person. And just, just to help us to uh, grow together and, uh, you know, just, just understand each other's roles and what they do. Just ready to have fun and get schooled by these young people. I ain't played chess in about three years. Um, about three years. I've been playing chess since third or fourth grade. At my school, if you were in like spectrum or something, you all had to learn because we all had to do a chess tournament. And so that was just always something that we all did. And eventually I came here. Started playing chess in, I want to say, sixth grade? I've been playing chess for five years. Something I like about chess is how, even though it's imperative that you need to think before you move. Sometimes you can just go with the flow, and both can be a little hard for me, especially since sometimes I'm a bit of an overthinker. You gotta think ahead, and you have to be able to adjust on the fly to what your opponent is trying to do. Hopefully not getting you know mentally exhausted, however, just building a relationship they can be established because I believe that it starts first with the children on making a positive impact on the community. Um, I didn't really care for it because I didn't know how to play it. Uh, I didn't realize how much fun it was because I thought most board games were trash. I only played Madden growing up, up until playing chess, and now I play both. But I know that what it has taught me, it's okay. taught me improvisation skills because I can figure out how to like think of a solution really quickly if I have to. Mm -hmm. Hey. You'll get some rematch one day. Right. You'll always appreciate it. Right. It was a good fight. I think that she actually, you know, she got the opportunity to lay down the law. I'm gonna give her that respect right there. You know, we we good. I uh, did pretty well. Um, had to sacrifice some pieces, but uh, it worked to try to get some positioning. But yeah, I feel good. I feel good. You know, I'm thankful that they uh, took it easy on me. You know, I fought it all the way to the end. But, you know, it has to be a winner. And it went to me. <laughs> uh, I'm a firm believer that it starts with respect. And if you give respect, you get respect. And, you know, the positive interactions just can do nothing but increase the trust, build a relationship, let them know that we're people too. You know, we're in uniform, we're not here. To, to just enforce law and, and continue to be cast into a negative light and show that, you know, we love everyone. <laughs> Justice serves as an opportunity to bring our kids together with police officers and allow them to see each other outside of the programming. The programming tells a lot of police officers that young black boys and girls are dangerous. The programming tells a lot of our young brothers and sisters that police officers are out to shoot us. So when we develop a program where we can bring both the police officers in the same space with our young people and let the kids beat up on police officers on a chessboard, but most important, allow both of them to see each other from a different light. This is why the justice service in point. And again, I challenge you all to engage. We can dislike something, but let's be a part of how do we bring things together. And this is what this conference was about.
While COVID-19 has interrupted many aspects of our lives, we believe a strong and active community can withstand these challenges it is presented with. Our theme of this year's conference is Community Resilience. Thank you for choosing this morning with us and enjoy the conference. Frazier, I'm in the sixth grade at Clark Middle School. Every year to think before you move scholarship recognizes four outstanding high school students in athens White County. A thousand dollar scholarship is rewarded to students who demonstrate exceptional persuasive writing skills while meeting academics and community service requirements. Hi, my name is Alinka Sandra Flores Lucio. I'm a senior student at Cedar Shoals High School and I'm looking forward to you all considering me for this scholarship. I'm a junior, so I'm definitely thinking about um, college and that sort of thing, so I want to major in political science, and with this, um, I want to be an attorney for um, underrepresented and underrepresented African Americans and people that cannot afford lawyers. So whether this is going to look like me working in a nonprofit or something along those lines, I definitely want to um, leave a mark and um, serve people throughout my whole entire life in any way possible. Good morning, my name is Robert Chapman. I'm in eighth grade at Hillsman Middle School. In past conferences, we invited community leaders to share their wisdom with our community. This year, we invited important community leaders to a panel discussion with my fellow peers. Our panelists for this year are Mr. Rick Dunn, Executive Director of the High School Completion Initiative Youth Advisor and Radio Personality at WXAG 92.7 FM, Commissioner Mar Mariah Parker, the Director to Commissioner and Hip Hop Artist and Activist, Mr. Lawrence Harris, the Chief of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnership at Clark County School District, Attorney Deborah Gonzalez, the District Attorney for the Western Judicial Circuit. Oftentimes, in so too many circles, we find a lot of policymakers or leaders sitting around talking to each other, but not too often do we find them sitting around talking to our youth. So we thought it was important to put out an annual conference as a way to bring this community together and start addressing real issues and real concerns within our communities. With COVID being in our backyard and every backyard in this country, we wanted to ask the question, what does community resilience look like? When I think of community resilience, I think of two things. I think of the networks of care that exist in our community, of people coming together to help each other, whether it's their church community, their family members, their friends, their neighbors. Um, but I also think of ingenuity, the ability for us to flexibly and creatively respond to crises in our communities by, you know, dreaming of solutions that meet the scale of the need in the moment. Okay, so basically to me it means the ability to bounce back, uh, to uh, stick it out through tough times and to uh, persevere to uh, a more positive outcome. When I think of community resilience, I think of the ability for our community to kind of surpass uh, many of the things and obstacles that kind of hit them on a day-to-day -day basis. So this ability to persevere, but an ability to almost be flexible and to see opportunity where it may not visibly exist. And sometimes that requires networking, social capital, requires other people. Um, but I think similar to what my colleague says about the ability to bounce back, uh, it's very easy to fall down, but to kind of get back up and say, you know, I'm not going to allow whatever's around me to keep me down because I deserve same, the same rights as you and other people around me. So I just think about it's our ability to kind of push forward despite what obstacles exist in front of us. So I think after hearing my colleagues, the only thing I will add is that to me, one of the most important aspects of resiliency is the idea of hope, right? That people believe that there can actually be an opportunity to do things and make it better. 
And that is what I think leads us to be motivated, to be resilient. That no matter what we're going to face, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We just got to keep at it. And along with that hope is that it's not just a hope for ourselves, right? It's a hope for the community and the others that are there with us. And so it also reminds us that in order to be resilient, we're not alone and we can't be alone. We need others to be there with us. And that's the way that we're going to be able to persevere and get to the goals that we need. Yes, and we should stop perhaps asking of so much resilience and start asking what, um, what people need from the outside in order to thrive in, way, in, in, in uh, a manner that answers to uh, the history of deprivation that, um, that has systemically oppressed communities that are falling behind. Okay, so what do you believe is going to take for us to become economically sufficient? You know, so we focus a lot of times on helping people climb the ladder to get to those better paying jobs, but ultimately those low paying jobs are still going to be there and someone's going to have to do them. And if we look at history, it's probably going to be black and brown folks, it's going to be, you know, poor white folks, it's going to be folks that are marginalized because of their uh, gender or, Im or immigration status or, you know, the people on the margins are going to be the ones picking up slack that we leave when we don't empower all workers to to fight for working conditions and pay that they deserve, when we don't start uh, working with employers when they want to come to Athens to say, not only like, oh, do you have jobs that people can ascend to that pay enough for you to feed your children and keep roof over your head, but do you provide a quality of life for everybody that you employ that uh, will make Athens a more economically self-sufficient place in the long run? So um, that's what we can do here. There's a lot to be said at other higher levels of government, but I gotta focus on what I have responsibility for and what I can control, and so that's what I'm trying to do. As an 18-year-old African-American male, I have seen in the past years mistreatment by either other citizens, uh, police officers, et cetera, et cetera. What is Athens doing to ensure the safety of the African-American youth? I think, at least where I sit, it's one of the most important questions that I could be asked tonight. You know, we had another police shooting this week. It's the ninth one in the state of Georgia since 2021 began that is being investigated by the GBI. In this case, the person was white. But in too many cases, that person is not. They're black or brown. They're young. The first thing that comes into my mind as a DA is, what are the facts, right? Who, what, when, where, how? It was a day I will never forget in my office of trying to get the facts. Who was shot? Where are they? Are they OK? Who did the shooting? Why did they shoot? How do I respond to my community? How do I make the right decisions as the prosecutor in this case? Too many times we've seen a DA who has refused to prosecute when there was a crime committed. In some ways, Armad Arbery, they actually hid the crime until video was released before they decided to make a decision. I have two grandsons. One is blonde and blue eyes, and one is dark skin, dark hair, and dark eyes. I love them both. But I know that this world will treat them both differently. And as a grandmother, I'm gonna do everything in my power that that stops. But I will tell you, it stops by the people that we put in the position to make that decision whether to prosecute or not. I have been very vocal that one of the problems in our system is systemic racism. It is not about a couple of bad seeds in the police department. It's about a system that's designed to oppress black, brown, and poor people. I have made it a commitment of mine to address that, and we have started. I know that this police shooting is a test, and people will be watching very closely the decisions I make. 
but I will also tell the people that I will be fair and just across the board. That whoever does something is to be held accountable regardless of their status, police officer, or just a person who was in the wrong place at the wrong time who made a bad mistake. Every decision that's made in my office is about life and death. And my, people might say, no, no, it's only about property. But when you take somebody's life, whether physically or whether by putting them into a cage, it is about their life. And we know that it also affects every generation past them, from their children to their grandchildren, into this cycle that needs to stop. And so you, as an 18-year-old black boy, or my grandson, as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, when he becomes 18, there shouldn't be a difference in your lives. You shouldn't be walking in fear. And your mother should not worry every day that you walk out that door. That is what I tell you. And I need you to help me make that reality. Many youth find themselves slipping through what we call the cracks, right? And what we mean by that is as they walk through life, they're invisible. People don't see them. And though people are being paid to deal with our kids, to counsel our kids, to give our kids guidance, be it the schools, be it the school counselors, um, what happens when we have 700 kids to one counselor? people are gonna fall through the cracks. I was one of those kids that fell through the cracks and I didn't have a direction coming up. So eventually the right people at the right time said the right things. And I, I found myself going to first a smaller college and then I transferred to the University of Georgia. Now, when I got into the master's program, I was given a scholarship. And as a way of paying it forward, we saw that it was important that we develop our think before you move scholarship. And this is an opportunity to recognize other youth, not just the youth that have access to the resources, but youth who don't know if they're gonna to go to college or not, don't know what their opportunities, what choices uh, they may have in life, but we offer them those scholarships. So every year we recognize four to six uh, local high school students, juniors and seniors, and we give them about $1,000 and sometimes a little more as a, just a jump start for them to at least start going to college. But for them to go there, we wanted the world to at least see, or at least this community to see the brilliance that comes from a lot of those kids that don't have the same uh, private schools or the same type of opportunities that other people may have, but they have that level of brilliance. And we wanted to, if at any point, to display that. So every year, we put our essay questions throughout the local high schools. We recognize four, and those four get an opportunity to present at this conference. And since we began our conference in 2012, so far we've given away 40, uh, over $40,000. Well, I would say about 40-something kids um, were awarded with the Think Before You Move scholarship. We don't have a lot of money. We have very little resources. However, it's not what you have, it's how you inspire the next generation. And those kids, they're now coming back and leading book clubs and doing different things within our communities. This is how we pay it forward. What's going on, y'all? Welcome to Pond Accelerator, where our job is to accelerate the minds of our youth. We partnered with NSBE, National Societies of Black Engineers, Spirit Tech, and Chesson Community all came together to give you all the Pond Accelerator. Kids are going to be learning how to code robots, build robots for our big competition that we're having. We're also teaching our kids a little bit about VR, virtual reality, AR, augmented reality. Just get our youth prepared for the future that is now. What got me interested in joining Pond Accelerator, it was just my love for building, like taking things apart and putting them back together. Also that my grandfather is an engineer, and I felt like this was my chance. This is my time to show it. So each one of y'all is going to have robots, and these robots are going to pretty much go ahead and build and do different unique things. And you are going to be responsible for coding the robot, for developing the robot, for getting things in place. I have like, I have like learned to be a leader, like 
be that person. Like if somebody's shy, then I ain't gotta be shy no more because I'm there and I can like talk to them, be friends with them. So I feel like it's really like help me be a better person. Develop that community teamwork that you need, that bond that you need to get these things together. Um, learn as much as you can. You have your coaches, Nesby, they're here to work with you. They're gonna be working on the side of you. And it's about you all having a good time, having fun. So my name is Anaya Sealy. Um, I'm a third year here at the University of Georgia, majoring in computer systems engineering. So that kind of combines computer science, you know, a lot of coding and also robotics. So basically what we're doing in here with the kids is kind of literally my major. So I'm definitely passionate about that. So you know we are in week three. So by today, each group should be completing your robots and then you're gonna be you're gonna begin the coding. For me, it's been the kids, like really like seeing like how they've developed from like week one and like just the team aspect of things. Um, it's given me a chance for one to like just see like where the community is at and like how the interest that they're taking in the in the robots themselves. We don't have to do much of the work, and how that that has propagated through each week has really brought me like a little bit of joy, but more so like okay, this is where our future is heading. Like this is these are this is the future. So yeah. Programming is essential. We need more programming uh, to expose kids to things that they may not otherwise be exposed to. Programming and a lot of the things that were going on. So I, I just found it was a tremendous opportunity. So it is our job to be part of the solution and help prepare our youth. So check us out with Pond Accelerator. We're gonna continue to accelerate the mind of our youth so they can grow to be healthy, functional kings and queens. Let's go. Follow your dreams and if you believe you can do it, you can do it. I got into Pond Accelerated through life. He came to a Nesby meeting and kind of presented it. And if you've ever met life, you know how passionate he is, how passionate he talks. So just hearing him talk about it one time got me into it and wanted to join. So I emailed him and he emailed me back and I got into Pond Accelerator. You see that so many things are happening in our community and around Atlanta, Georgia and around the state. And if our kids don't have the skill that they are able to code and do some of these important things that come with technology, then we want to get left behind as we often do. So the purpose of us putting this program together was to do that. Let's actually get our kids to start learning about all the latest technology that is around them. We've invested a pretty good penny in purchasing these robots and getting this be on board. And now we have a program here that's ready to make it happen. All right, Gertz. All right, we gotta give each other that fist There we go. All right, there we go. Community Center. Hope everybody's having a good afternoon. Um, I couldn't be more excited than to realize that what Chesson Community has done all along, which is implore you to greater and greater heights of strategy, including with the young woman over there who just like cut me off at the knees on this chessboard over here, has taken it to the next level. But it's going to take the skills that you guys have been talking about to fill the jobs in those places. So when Mud tells you that what you are getting here is going to be what you can take forward into life to be fulfilled, to feel good about yourself, and to make some real cash, he's not lying. So I can't tell you enough how excited I am that you are all part of this program, and I'm even more excited to know that there are going to be chapters ahead. God bless. All right. making it to this point. I remember coming by about three or four weeks ago and the robots weren't even where they are now. So you all have done some impressive work. Um, but I just wanted, I'm going to be short today because I'm just really excited to see you all get to it and see what you all can do and what you've built here today. Uh, but STEM education is important. It not only teaches you critical thinking, but it teaches you innovation. So as Mayor Gertz was saying, there are jobs here for you. They're already lined up for you. So if you go to college and you study engineering, you study robotics, you can get employed making a lot of good money. I'd also challenge you to say you can also start your own business. 
and build your own business from the ground up using the skill sets that you've learned while in this program. So don't let it stop now. I always say education isn't an eight hour a day job. It doesn't start the moment you enter your school walls or your virtual Zoom walls and it doesn't end at three o'clock or 345 when you get out of school. This is education. On behalf of the Clark County School District, our superintendent, Dr. Zanona Thomas, I just want to say thank you to Chesson Community. Thank you to our UGA partners. Just thank you to you all for doing this. This is huge. This is big. And hopefully we can keep this going. So thank you. These are the type of things they have to, they have to participate in. Yeah, I'm gonna let you participate uh, in, in basketball and football and other, you know, all the athletic extracurriculars. But we can also participate in robotics and learning chess and developing our critical thinking skills because these are also going to have a huge impact on us. So I would just challenge us to make sure that we continue to hold ourselves and the students accountable. You know, it is one thing for us to buy them the PlayStation 5 that comes out this year. It's another thing for us to train them to create the next PlayStation 5 that comes out in a few years. It's one thing for us to give them money um, for, for, to spend on things that they enjoy. It's another thing for us to equip them with the tools that they'll need to be able to buy any of the things that they may want in this life. And so again, as a community, uh, as a family, as, as brothers and sisters, um, I just encourage us to continue encouraging our young people.
Every year we welcome students from across the state to Athens, Georgia to compete in our annual youth chess competition. This year we were limited to eight players and teams. We all met up at the Athens local library. Please enjoy the competition. A youth chess tournament is something that really, that's really dear to me because uh, this is an opportunity to bring all of the youth in this region together and just compete for about $1,400, right? Now, because of COVID, uh, we then opened it up to the public. We kept it internal with the kids that we initially deal with. But if it wasn't for COVID, we usually have anywhere from uh, 100 to 150 kids that are coming uh, and, and playing chess with us, but we had to stay safe this year. Um, and as you saw, um, initially we have it set in three segments. We have elementary school, middle school, and high school. And what we do is, I think what separates us from other chess uh, clubs is we try to encourage teamwork. So if you saw it was three people to a team, those three usually represent one. So we challenge in our youth to really think together, work together, plan together, strategize together. This is how we change communities, is by working together, not in our individual silos. So the idea behind that is three people equals one team. And so you probably saw three, three kids played versus one person. And the people say, I want to play solo. You know, we allow them to play solo, where others want to play as a team. And we, we always believe that more minds can give more perspective and more direction. So this is what you saw in here. As you saw, the kids had a good time. You know, more than just, you know, I, we're not just about teaching them to be masters and grandmasters. I know a lot of homeless people that live under bridges that play chess. So chess is not the way out. We have to actually have more than just chess. We have to incorporate other skill sets that these kids can learn the strategies of life, learn the strategies of game, but also get other skill sets needed to carry them forward. So what you saw in there today was the kids just battled it out. And they battled out for, um, a thousand dollars, right? First place when I got 700, seven, second place when I got 300. And this was a way to really also to motivate our kids. We tell the kids throughout the year, practice, practice. Every Monday, we, we do our work, we tell them practice, practice. And we can tell them to show up and we don't show up, right? But this is just an opportunity for us to constantly encourage and constantly, you know, just provide a platform that if you put that work in there, you're going to win at the end. First game, we just had to play, we had to realize that it was just you know, we had to adjust because the board was a bit bigger, so we just had to adjust to um, seeing it a little different. But once that happened, it was just about playing your game and playing you and doing the best that you can. I mean, it was a team effort. Like, I can't take all the credit because if my brother wasn't here, I don't think we, I would have done as good as I would have done. Um, as I said earlier, Nobody, nobody can beat us. We're unstoppable. Each day you just gotta be better. Each day you gotta, you gotta want to meet more people, and that's what chess and community does. We just bring more people together, and we just wanna um, just get better every day as a community, as a country, and as a world. Um, I'm real, I'm good at making friends, but like this, like when I get to meet more people in a, in a sport, and I just feel like it's an opportunity. Okay, you're going against them but you, you actually have them as a friend too. My name is Salai Diakampuna and I'm a 10th grader at Clark Central High School. Our essay prompt for this year was as follows. Describe how your community, local, state, national, and global can demonstrate community resilience in 2021. Our three goals for this essay prompt were as following. One, define community resilience and describe what it means to you and the people in your community. Two, identify a resilient person and or community that you admire and respect. <coughs> three, describe how you will contribute to building a resilient community around you that will promote community healing, wellness, compassion, and empowerment in the era of COVID-19. Please help me welcome our 2021 essay winners. Corey Edmonds, Alan Flores Lucio, Haya Delane, and my big headed brother, Yosha Diakampula. Thank you.
A community is a great place that we can call home, but our community is different. It helps whenever we need help and it gives back whenever we can. In these hard times of COVID-19, we have been helping to give food to those who need it. So the way that the food pantry works is that a day before, we normally pack the bags, put in the food, put in goods that would be normally like things that people would need, like split peas, beans, just things like that. They may be small, but I mean, it helps a lot at the end of the day. The other food bank that I help at, it changes its location a lot just because they try to help different communities, even though they mainly try to influence more of the Latino Hispanic community because they're the ones that organize it. So they try to help those because a lot of them lost their jobs due to COVID, but we help anyone that actually needs it. That um, specific organization is called Dignidad de Migrante. And I mainly get in contact with a good friend of ours. Her name's Esther. She's always helped us with anything that we need. She, if we need any help on getting information, she helps us, she gets that for us. So we find that as a way of giving back to them and helping them as well. We normally try to give them a little bit of flour, what we call masa, which is what we use to make tortillas. And it's just small things like that that really help and encourage the community to actually come out, help us, or actually receive food from us. And my three biggest inspirations are Miss Marina Cobb, Esther, and my gorgeous mother, Victoria Lucio, which she has always helped me, encouraged me, just told me to actually try. She's never let me give up. And the reason that I actually love Miss Marina Cobb is because She's always tried to be there for us. It doesn't matter how hard the situation gets. Um, she's always there. She's always trying to help. She's always helping her community, trying to give back for a community that helped her. And then Esther, she's just an amazing little woman. <laughs> she's tiny. She's, I guess you can say she's tidy, tiny but mighty because anywhere she goes, she'll just become the boss automatically. I normally like to say that my mom has been such a big influence. I can't thank her enough for everything that she's done for me. She's pushed me to become what I am today. And honestly, I don't think I'd be here without her. And thanks to her, I got accepted at Valdosta State University and am attending this summer. And hopefully I will become a English to Spanish and English to American Sign Language interpreter. And I'm hoping I will eventually become a general doctor and maybe locate here in Athens. I want to thank Chesson Community, the organization, the brother and now sisterhood that has watched him grow. We moved here from California. He was 12, so he hadn't really experienced so much of life. All the values and things that you really instill in your child that start the transformations, he pretty much went through those here. And so to watch him grow from this introverted person to now such goal-oriented, um, very authentic in what he wants to do, who he is, 
and watch that like the energy of friends that attract to him and things like that um, I'm very proud of you son get to the point where, we, where you're at. Now, of course, uh, Josh Sean, this is one of many steps um, in moving forward. Um, but then just seeing you grow into the man that you are now today, uh, I really, um, you know, it's really amazing to see that transformation. And so I know you're gonna be uh, successful in life. You say, fuck my life. When I first met those songs, I really messaged you. I really messaged you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but like, once I got past, like once I actually started talking to you, hang out with you, you became like a great friend of mine. Uh, you've been my homie since like, I was in like sixth grade. Uh, and we just like, we came up together through sixth grade, through high school, we've been close ever since. Uh, you're one of my closest friends. I'm really glad to see you succeed. Uh, you're a real smart dude, and I know you're gonna do well, so. I'm really grateful for trusting community. Like, like I said, like what everyone said, I started here like when I was 12. I'm not gonna lie, I was quiet. Like, I didn't talk to no one. But then, like as I grown with Chester community, I started to communicate better and like started developing like some leadership roles, which kind of helped me develop into the person I am. And like being by myself, like meeting like being an only child, and then just being with my mom. You guys helped me a lot, like going through school and going through different phases of my life. So I just want to say thank you. Oh. I wanted that. I actually, I actually was expecting that. I was expecting that move. One year ago, our world shifted. We awaken in a global pandemic and a real-time financial and logistical nightmare for small businesses, educational institutions, and our most honorable essential workforce, from whom we owe our deepest gratitude. The dedication of the men and women who continue to risk it all and push on the front lines every day are undoubtedly the unsung heroes of our city and nation, of whom we can never truly repay. In the blink of an eye, our city and nation had a great task and responsibility at hand to quickly build and extend our collective local capacity and forge a continued vision of leadership, assurance, and public safety. Proudly, our agencies and organizations from the east side to the west side, from the university to the grassroots initiatives, all worked in their individual efforts of service to collectively build and strengthen our local tenacity as we quickly sought to redefine a new and ever-changing norm. As a student journalist on the WXAG Education Matters radio show, I had the pleasure of interviewing countless local community leaders, budding politicians, school board members, and like, who continue to inspire me and fellow listeners on our collective why. Why we have to maintain hope. Why we have to maintain fortitude and why we have to truly be a community of resilience. Dr. Martin Luther King once reminded us, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. On every level of our beloved city, I can say we responded to the crisis in ways that strengthen our community bonds, resources, and capacity to cope. New programs and resources were put in place to support small minority businesses. Food banks and pantries worked tirelessly among faith-based organizations to offer food to families in need. Our community resilience has been demonstrated in a number of ways through political advocacy, business development, teachers, and learning support for students. One such organization to whom I was greatly inspired and had the opportunity of being an occasional summer volunteer was the Farm to Neighborhood program led by Rashi Malcolm, an inspiring local restaurant owner and seasoned entrepreneur who serviced over 5,000 pounds of fresh farm produce to low-income families. This committed organization helped to close the access gap of fresh produce in our most vulnerable Athens communities 
and couldn't be in more perfect timing as the national health pandemic has fallen before us. As mental and depleting physical health continue to grow of great concern, fear, anxiety, and stress began to plague both the young and old alike. COVID has seemingly taken so much away from students, socially, emotionally, and instructionally. I too struggle to stay grounded throughout this year, but I, like Ms. Rashi, am too an overcomer. As women of color, we have faced adversity from both outside and within our own community for being strong, creative, and driven. I have never let those obstacles along my path keep me from reaching my personal and educational goals as I have learned the skill of turning lemons into lemonade by looking within myself for the changes that I want to seek. And that is the black girl magic and resilience from which I come from. What I have learned is that in this most critical time of our city and nation, that I can indeed be changed by what happens to us, but I refuse to be reduced by it. And my hope for my community going forward is that we fully embrace that we are not what happened to us, but only what we choose to become. Thank you. Got him, got him. Stretch down, stretch down, stretch down, stretch down, stretch down. All right, all right. We're going to go ahead and we're going to get a, we're gonna get a check in started. Oh, yeah. Some of the parts need to just relax. Mm -hmm. Then we just sat there and just let the um, let the um, the water flow take the kayak. Yeah. This is our first time kayaking. We enjoy. We loved it very much. It was very an eye open experience. Father and son on the chest board, ain't that something? We call out for an era of community resilience during the pandemic, which has caused issues like an increase in the demand for food amongst local families within our community. To outsiders, community resilience can be defined as the sustained ability of a community to use available resources to respond to, withstand, and recover from adverse situations. 
to me, community resilience is the ability of a community to come together, bounce back, and thrive during a time that has brought us down. In this case, the coronavirus pandemic. However, we can choose to look at the things that bring us down as things that make us stronger, and that's what I believe make a community more resilient. In contrast to using what is available, in my community, I believe we come together to create the things we need in order to help others and heal from tragedy. Community resilience means to unite and help those around you. There's an old African saying that translates to humanity. It states, I am because you are. Humanity, a noun, meaning human beings collectively. We collectively as a community must come together and show humanity by serving those around us. It's our responsibility as humans. I take pride in how my city feeds off the concept that my success is limited until my community, brothers, and sisters are succeeding beside me. This is why I would describe my community as resilient. Our schools have provided tons of resources to help those in need of food through our school's food bank. Ms. Angela Gay, a school social worker in Athens, is a perfect example of someone who I would describe as resilient. She states, the pandemic has shown an increased need for food requests from some of our Cedar Shoals families due to food shortage. We are fortunate to partner with the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia and Emmanuel Episcopal Church and other community partners to keep our pantry fully stocked. Members like Ms. Gay play a large role in the demonstration of community resiliences during the hard hard times we are currently enduring as a nation. As I listen to the wisdom of those before me, I think about who is the most resilient person that I know. The pastor of my church is one of the many people in my city that I believe contributes to our ability to come together and handle whatever is thrown at us as a community. This has helped me grow my passion to serve others and challenge me to contribute to my community in a positive way by volunteering at my church's food bank on Saturday mornings. We have served hundreds of families by coming together as a community to help those in need of food. I admire my team's dedication towards fixing the hunger problem in my community and neighboring communities. My pastor, along with Miss Angela Gay, are two of the many resilient people who are helping my community heal during the hard time this pandemic has given us. I plan to continue spending my time volunteering at my church and helping those with food demands. While this is one of my contributions towards my community, I do not plan to stop there. Say what? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, I think so.
<laughs> so here, here is the brood. This is where the young bees. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, we've all been forced to adjust the way we live. Technology has been the driving force to provide some sense of normalcy and social interaction with work, school, and other what would be regular in-person events being all done virtually. It has caused certain obstacles aside from public safety that one normally wouldn't have to deal with. Some people have thrived in their isolation, going from physical community to a virtual community, while others have struggled. As we're looking for a way to come back to true normalcy, being resilient is a key component in finding it. Webster defines resilience as the capability of a strained body to recover its size, shape, or deformation caused by, especially by compressed stress, or in simpler terms, one's ability to bounce back after undergoing large amounts of trauma, adversity, or stress. Community resilience comes from the entire population being affected by a certain issue and their ability to put the community back on its feet. This weekend, I had the privilege of sitting down with four Athens, leader, Athens community leaders in, a, in leading a discussion where community resilience was a major topic. They gave me the opportunity to dissect and evaluate what it truly means to be for to have a community resilience. It starts with a point that I got from Miss Deborah Gonzalez. She started off by saying, in order to spark community resilience, there needs to be hope. In order to push through your conflicts or bounce back, as told by Mr. Rick Dunn, you must be able to find the light at the end of the tunnel and focus yourself on it, knowing that the end goal's success trumps all the adversity and trauma that the community faced. I'd like to tie these two points together. I believe that the crucial part in the community that the community faced being resilient is that some of the citizens and leaders are flexible and are able to help tackle many problems. Mr. Lawrence Harris, another community activist, added, the more people are flexible, the easier it is to be, be it, it, the easier it becomes to speed up the speed and boost the community resilience. Another way to help community resilience is to have good networking within the community and out, and out of the community, as told by Ms. Mariah Parker. Proper networking out of the community helps expand knowledge and resources, helping aid the community's resilience. In my eyes, for a community to show true resilience, after adversity, they must come together willing to work for a common set of goals, using internal and external knowledge and resources. Each individual should be able to work on multiple aspects to help the community reach its goal. For a community to become resilient, there should be resilient individuals as role models. Growing up, the one person you always heard about was Dante Robinson, one of the best football players from Athens. As a children, we were told that he was a young student athlete we wanted to be like. Star high school athlete, top rated recruit, division one football player, power five, and a first round draft pick. Nowadays, these kind of players are rich private school students. I expected to hear the same thing when they were going to talk about his upbringing. A rich Athens teen hated from the world that got the opportunity to play because someone in their family knew a coach or two. Boy, was I wrong. My first time hearing the story, I was shocked to hear how much we 
had in common with Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson grew up in Broad Acres. He knew about the troubles in Athens. He grew up surrounded by problems and distractions. He proved that anybody from Athens with a will, willing to work had a shot at achieving your dreams. Resilience is who my people are and I will emulate that character. Good morning, my name is Leah Barnett. And my name is Laura Barnett. No matter what a bus looks like, without the proper fuel to rev its engine, it is unable to leave the lot. We want to take a moment to recognize our partners, sponsors, and donors who believe in our mission to inspire and engage a new generation of leaders. Thank you for fueling our bus. Thank you, Kathy Prescott and Grady Thrasher, Downs Family Funds, Athens Regional Library, Give Back Rent to their team, AHA, Athens Housing Authority, Partners at Georgia Power, Kia Boer Foundation, Dan T. and Sarah Winch Koken, Riley Family Fund, The Winthrop Family Fund, Kelly Family Kadu Foundation, BBGA Law Firm, Athens East Development Corporation, and Smith Tomporowski Family Fund. You know, Chess and Community is about more than just a one time activity and engagement for our youth. No, a lot of those students, the older ones, they've been with us since middle school. And now we're seeing them go away to college. And we know that they're gonna come back and they're gonna give back. Or oh, whatever community they decide to land in, they're gonna make some changes in those communities. This is the work that we do. It's tiring sometimes, but it's rewarding because I have children in this community and I now know that I've planted enough seeds, or we, not I, we have planted enough seeds in this community. We have enough young people who understand the focus of we have to rebuild our community. So in a nutshell, Chess and Community is, is this. Chess is the entry point, community is the exit strategy. We teach them chess, we teach them strategies, we teach them systems thinking, we teach them strategic thinking, logic thinking, and we allow them to really use that and bring that to inspire and engage their communities. This is what Chester Community is about. Visit us, chessacommunity.org. Be a part of the change in your community. Thank you. <laughs>